Welcome to Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Uh, very recently, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC have launched uh, the Putrajaya Vision 2040. This is, of course, an aspirational argument that is being put forth by APEC members uh, to put forward the economic growth plan for the next 20 years. Uh, APEC uh, Vision 2040 Putrajaya replaces the uh, old 1994 BOGO. Uh, agreement um, and has been updated and refreshed and it was birthed in a situation where we are facing a challenge that we have never faced before um, both as an economic block as well as our own country now we're not alone in this all the countries around the world are also arguing the same issue in terms of economic prosperity through trying times and because of that we want to understand a little bit better about how Putrajaya Vision 2020 was created, was birthed and perhaps even how it was uh, conceived in light of all these challenges ahead. Because of that I have uh, with me uh, the membership, the, uh, the representative from APEC as well as from MITI, uh, Ms. Arividya Arimutu. She is, of course, the Director of Substantive Matters at APEC 2020 National Secretariat. We've had her on before. I'm pleased to have her on again. Um, how are you, uh, Arividya? I hope everything is okay on your end. Yes, yes, I'm good and I uh, hope you're keeping well too. Uh, let's start with uh, the most basic question about what is the main objective of crafting the Putrajaya Vision 2040? Okay, so I think uh, you had pointed it out earlier when uh, you spoke about the BOGO goals. So the BOGO goals that were launched in 1994 reached maturity this year. So clearly there is a need for us to build on those goals and uh, continue the unfinished business of BOGO goals. So that's number one, to build on BOGO goals. Secondly, we also needed a document or a vision to set the strategic direction for the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, this will also serve as a primary reference point for all of APEC work programs. So those were the main three reasons uh, why we needed a document to, in some ways, replace the BOGO goals as well, but at the same time, uh, build on the unfinished uh, business of that document. Now, a lot of people are arguing that uh, this uh, vision, Putrajaya 2040, is not made in isolation. It's, in, it's made in tandem with a lot of other uh, agreements around the world. But of course, this also ties in closely with some of the long-term project uh, economic plan that we have right now. For instance, the Shared uh, Prosperity Plan. Um, how would the uh, Putrajaya Vision 2020, sorry, uh, how would uh, Putrajaya Vision 2040 tie up with the shared prosperity plan that have already been announced uh, previously? So the idea that uh, the distributive effects of uh, trade and investment are not uh, felt by all our people is not something new. I think this is an argument that uh, we've heard for quite some time now. It is accepted that trade and investment has created and generated a lot of wealth in the Asia Pacific region but the benefits accruing from that wealth may not be palpable or may not be disseminated to all our people. So the concept of uh, shared prosperity, which is a national concept, and I think we have used the Putrajaya vision to elevate this idea to a regional level. So there are elements in the vision that talks about shared prosperity. For example, the vision begins with the idea of an open, dynamic, resilient, and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2040 for the prosperity of all our people and future generations. So clearly there's a reference to shared economic prosperity there. Also, if you go on to read that document, there are a lot of uh, phrases in that um, vision that references back to shared prosperity. For example, we talk about bringing palpable benefits and uh, greater well-being to all our people. And these are not just words that uh, appear on the document. These are negotiated phrases. And we have it there because we want to be able to reflect uh, shared prosperity in the Putrajaya vision. 
So of course, uh, this has not been like any other year. So what we have experienced uh, this year and um, the fact that we are going into an economic recovery phase necessitates this discussion even further uh, because uh, there is now a real pressing need to bring economic benefits stemming from trade and investment to all our people, particularly vulnerable groups who are likely to be most affected by the pandemic and uh, who will require a lot more facilitation and help coming out of this crisis. So there is that element of uh, shared prosperity that resonates throughout the vision. I, I know that you've touched a little bit in terms of the content and the theme of uh, Preserve Vision 2040, but let's go into some of the details uh, into it. There's some sections including trade and investment, innovation and digitalization, um, strong balance, secure, sustainable and inclusive growth that you actually um, uh, argued fully uh, just now. Uh, but let's talk about these general themes and what constitutes inside each and every single section of it. Um, let's start with trade and investment. What is APEC's position in terms of growth with regard to trade and investment for the next 20 years that is reflected inside Putrajaya Vision 2040? So APEC is a regional economic forum. So any document that comes out of APEC would be incomplete if we do not touch upon trade and investment elements. So clearly trade and investment will continue to be a key economic driver for the region coming out of the COVID-19 crisis. So that's why there is a specific reference to trade and investment in that document. And also work on this document uh, began around 2016, but uh, there was a different time then. It's a different world now. So there is also a lot of uh, focus on um, trying to make uh, the vision more responsive, more relevant and more agile. And these were considerations that uh, we took on board when we drafted the vision. So that's one of the reasons why uh, you will see references to resilient supply chains, for example, within the first section of the vision, which is on trade and investment. So usually in APEC, when we discuss trade and investment, we talk about reaffirming our belief in the rules-based multilateral trading system or trade liberalization efforts to preferential trading arrangements. But this time around, we also see a reference in the vision that um, talks about responsible business conduct or resilient supply chains. And I think uh, these are important markers nowadays because of the crisis situation we are in with regards to COVID-19 and the fact that uh, the economic recovery process will not just be about uh, trade and investment in the conventional sense, uh, but trade and investment that uh, brings distributive effects, as I mentioned earlier, and also trade and investment that is responsive to a post-pandemic recovery period. Now that's critical, right? Because uh, trade and investment is something that we all want, particularly when we talk about a coalition like the APAC. The whole main agenda, of course, is to try to reinvigorate trade and investment. But despite everyone's well wishes, we can't make it work for 2020 because of the pandemic and because of the challenges that lie ahead. So one thing that I want to ask you is, do you feel that the way we think about trade and investment has to also now think about uh, if something like this were to happen again in the next 20 years and you know more likely than not a lot of scientists are arguing pandemics are a thing are a feature these days so we have to be ready for you know any in eventualities that might take place um, so what would be some of the rethinking process when it comes to planning for the next 20 years when it comes to trade and investment in light of a pandemic recurring or this particular pandemic continuing to, uh, to persist in the years to come? Yeah, so I think that's one of the reasons why we have tried to keep the scope of the vision broad enough. So we have set parameters, but uh, it's quite broad. So you will see, for example, we talk about uh, three main drivers for the economy, trade and investment being one of them. But we've also referenced uh, prep, uh, preparedness in terms of how do we respond to this pandemic or even other emergencies in the region? 
And how do we ensure that uh, trade and investment continues to flow even during times of crisis? So this is something that uh, we will see more details on next year as we work on the implementation plan. Uh, of course, the vision is a high-level policy document uh, at the leader's level. So a lot of the actionable items uh, will come in next year when we discuss the implementation plan. But having said that, I think uh, the fact that we also reference innovation and digitalization, for example, in the vision, goes to show that this will be a key component, including for trade and investment. Yeah. We are already hearing about uh, discussions related to digital trade, for example. So this will be key components uh, going forward as uh, more and more transactions on trade will likely happen online. Uh, there could be a lot more virtual presence than a physical presence, including for commercial entities. So the nature of trade and investment will also likely evolve. And uh, the vision is broad enough to cater to those changes. You, you, you've actually um, segued into the uh, more important matter right now, which is innovation and digitalization. Um, 2020 has seen the adoption um, both in the public sector as well as in the private sector uh, digitalization, including the very APEC meeting itself. Um, never before have we seen um, trans-regional cooperation, countries, uh, members and leaders coming together digitally online for the first time. Um, at high level meetings um, when we have ministers um, and of course prime ministers and equivalents including presidents uh, joining in for the first time to discuss high level stakes. Um, this of course is a key feature of everyone's future planning uh, but of course uh, I would imagine Project Vision 2040 would flesh out more details uh, in terms of the innovation and digitalization plan and aspirations. Uh, what would be some of the key highlights that you want to share with us when it comes to innovation and uh, digitalization uh, for the next 20 years um, to boost uh, economic growth? So the digitalization and innovation section of the vision recognizes these elements as uh, important drivers for the economy as well. So. Of course, when we talk about uh, digitalization and innovation, we must be able to create an enabling environment that would foster innovation. So we could have all sorts of innovation policies in place, but if we don't have the right environment, then um, innovation will likely not happen. So the um, vision underscores the importance of creating the right environment for innovation and digitalization. That's number one. Secondly, it also references the need to narrow digital divide to improve access as well as to facilitate the flow of data so some of these elements of course come from existing documents for example the roadmap that APEC already has in place for the internet and digital economy and so there are some references in the vision that uh, highlight the markers that have already been identified to improve digitalization and innovation in the region through other APEC documents. But most importantly, I think what's important to highlight here is uh, the fact that since this is a high level policy document by the leaders, this marks uh, the commitment that APEC leaders have taken to recognize the pressing need for us to innovate and digitalize now so that uh, we can recover quickly from the crisis and uh, navigate the region towards a path of robust economic growth. So it is a recognition for these important elements in the process of uh, recovery and growth. And since it's coming from all 21 APEC economic leaders, I think it, it places a special emphasis on these elements. Uh, another key component of uh, Putrajaya Vision 2040 is of course having a strong, balanced, secure, sustainable and inclusive growth. You've touched upon this element a few times already in this interview. But I want to tie in back to the kind of issues that we have faced throughout the year. What would be some of the learnings that we have gotten throughout the year um, that we can see being reflected inside uh, Vision 2040? So as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, the framework for the vision was already in place uh, sometime around 2016 because discussions have begun then. 
although these were good reference points, we also needed to recognize that uh, we can no longer just produce a vision that responded to trade and economic challenges that we faced in 2016 or 2017. This is a year like none other. Therefore, we have had to revisit some of the reports and references and other APEC documents uh, which were produced in the past to try and update them to respond to the crisis. And so uh, there are things in the vision which may not have appeared if uh, this wasn't a COVID-19 year. For example, and I think I mentioned this earlier, the idea that we need to reference resilience in the vision, that only came about because we had to address uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Similarly, uh, when we talk about inclusive and sustainable growth, that takes a new turn now because it's, um, of course, it's about bringing benefits to all our people. But uh, the need to do that becomes even more pronounced now. It becomes even more pressing now because there are so many people who are expected to be pushed into poverty because of this crisis. And therefore, trade and investment have assumed a renewed role in uh, trying to alleviate poverty, in trying to expedite economic recovery and growth. And so the vision talks about uh, all these elements. But of course, because it's a very high level policy document, the language is kept broad enough for us to have uh, specific work programs next year that could then uh, correspond to some of the things I mentioned earlier, like uh, economic recovery, helping those who are most vulnerable, the MSMEs, for example, uh, women or uh, those most affected uh, by the crisis. So clearly the vision allows us enough scope to be able to do all this. Fantastic. Uh, we will take a short break. When we come back, we'll discuss more on how this impacts you, the Rakyat of Malaysia. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, this is Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. On the line right now is Arividya Arimutu, the Director of Substantive Matters at APEC 2020. She is, of course, the National Secretariat there. I'm dialing in from MITI right now, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. We're talking about uh, Putrajaya Vision 2040, uh, the mega plan or the high level plan of economic growth for the APEC region for the next 20 years. This replaces the BOGO agreement that was signed in Indonesia in 1994. So it is, in a way, overdue for us to get um, some sort of an update uh, terms of growth for the next 20 years. Um, so, uh, Arivedia, when, when this document was being um, crafted, uh, who would be some of the stakeholders that came together uh, in order for this document to become a reality? So, of course, uh, the document uh, was drafted by policymakers, and uh, all 21 APEC economies were represented by the senior officials, who are usually the trade policymakers in their economies. So, from Malaysia's perspective, I can also share that uh, we worked very closely with the uh, ABAC the APEC Business Advisory Council. Uh, they are the private sector representative within APEC. So it's important for us, of course, to get the views of the business community from the region on what they think should appear in the vision. So this is a consultation process that we do quite regularly. And uh, of course, the line ministries. So the line ministries come on board as and when necessary. So, for example, I can recall that uh, there was a period of time where we were talking about whether the vision should reference health countermeasures to mitigate and combat the COVID-19 crisis. So clearly this is something that uh, we needed the Ministry of Health's views on, so we consulted them. So as we go on through the drafting process, as we go through that journey, we will consult our line ministries uh, as and when necessary. But of course, uh, given the nature of negotiations, a lot of things evolve towards the end. And what you see on the table is a compromise text. So. Yeah. When you see the final draft, you don't see that term health countermeasures at all. Yeah. So, because this is a compromised text and it has evolved over the sessions. Compromised over 21 stakeholders, no less. Yeah. So, 
So I just, I just want to focus a little bit more about the challenges in order to make this vision happen. Um, when inculcating this argument, uh, it was already seen that there's a lot of compromise. That's one challenge, I suppose, because one um, economy would want something else more than the other. Um, and because you need to find a consensus, 21 countries have agreed that this would be the best way forward for everyone. Um, that's one challenge. But what would be other challenges in order for this uh, vision to be a reality for the next uh, 20 years? Okay, so for it to become a reality, of course, I think the main challenge would be translating this high level policy document into a set of actionable items that bring benefits to all our people. So I think that will be the main challenge. And of course, Malaysia will be working closely with all of the economies, including the host and chair for next year, New Zealand, to make this a possibility. So we already have uh, some ideas, and uh, this is uh, particularly so on areas where Malaysia has a specific interest and where we want to see a continuation of our agenda and our priority areas that began this year. For example, this year we started discussions on beyond GDP matters, and that's an important component to sustainable and inclusive growth because we need to look beyond just economic numbers to be able to measure actual benefits that um, economic efforts or liberalization efforts bring to our people. So that's a conversation of significant value, and uh, we commenced that discussion this year, and we hope to see it continue. Similarly, we've also had uh, some initiatives on um, food waste management. And uh, since uh, New Zealand's a priority area for next year, we'll also look into food system, including food security. This is another area where we hope uh, work will continue. So of course, if I were to link this back to the vision, I would say since the vision is broad enough to talk about sustainability and inclusivity, these are all areas of interest uh, for us. And these are also areas which we could use the vision to translate this into work programs for APAC, capacity building initiatives within APAC, and uh, that would be useful for the people of uh, the Asia Pacific. Um, let's talk about the people of the Asia Pacific right now. If we were to distill this to very few words, what would this vision Pujaya 2040 would mean for the residents of the Asia Pacific region? To put it simply, I would say that uh, it uh, demonstrates the unwavering commitment of APAC leaders to ensure that the work we do in APAC brings prosperity to the people of Asia Pacific. And uh, when I say prosperity, it's not just from an economic perspective, although there is a specific emphasis there, given the fact that APEC is an economic forum. But also this year, I think we have seen the need to strike a balance between trade and health policies, for example, which is why in the vision, we also talk about greater health and well-being to all our people. And that is not just economic health, but also financial health and human health. So those would be the benefits for the people of the Asia Pacific. And of course, uh, we cannot uh, go or without discussing how 2020 has shaped this kind of document um, when it was created. Uh, you were mentioning that work has started since 2016. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of things have happened between then and now, but most importantly, it's the situation of 2020 that has uh, shaken how we should view the world in the near term, in the mid term, as well as in the long term. How has 2020 shaped the way we think about when crafting long term, high level, leader level plans moving forward? I think uh, it's a game changer, to say the least, uh, because uh, Somewhere around uh, February, I think, when we were still at the initial stages of drafting the post-2020 vision. As I mentioned, the work started in 2016, but drafting in earnest began this year. So in early this year, we were still talking about APAC and its role in trade and investment. Of course, there were discussions on digitalization and innovation as well, but none of these elements were seen through a COVID-19 lens or a pandemic lens or any other form of emergency that the region may face in the future. So that 
was a real game changer for the vision. So there's a lot of um, references there that talk about resilience or preparedness so that the vision is responsive to the future challenges of the region. But of course, in terms of negotiating a document like this through a virtual form has its own set of difficulties. I've been in the business of trade negotiations for almost two decades now. And it's always easier to negotiate any document when you are meeting your colleagues face to face, not only because you are able to understand their difficulties better, but also because there are a lot of discussions that happen outside the meeting room. So when you're having coffee, for example, and also better able to read their body language so that you know which issues are of fundamental difficulties for them and which are just a matter of being bargaining chips. None of that was possible throughout this year because we were negotiating everything virtually. So it was a process where we learned how to do this effectively through footnotes, through emails, through WhatsApp chats. And um, it has been painful. It, ha it must be painful. And there must be nights where you cried yourself to sleep because no, I mean, you know, this is not easy, you know, um, and, and for you guys to make sure that this is being able to be pulled off, um, that's one hell of a job uh, and, and must be commended. But, but really, what do you think uh, is going to work for next year or the years to come? Do you think that this is going to be the way forward or eventually we're going to see some hybrid? What, what's your personal view on this? Well, I'm not sure whether we will be able to travel next year, although I do see travel bubbles coming out of some economies in the region. And a lot of uh, negotiations or uh, trade related work is happening through digital channels. So this could be the, the way forward for the future. What was particularly difficult is, of course, having to manage expectations from 21 economies. But when you have one economy that insists on uh, inclusion of certain elements because it's a must have for them, but the same element could be a red line for another economy. So they do not want to see it, absolutely do not want to see it in the vision. That becomes very difficult. It is still quite easy to manage expectations when everyone has a different set of must haves or red lines. But when one economy's must have becomes another economy's red line, I think that's where we have had sleepless nights, like you pointed out, where we had to offer textual proposals that could form a middle ground solution that's acceptable to everyone. So those kind of attempts would have been much easier in a face-to-face -face format, whereas in a digital format, as I mentioned earlier, it's about writing proposals using footnotes and uh, sending out emails, explaining your position very clearly because yeah. sometimes words can be misconstrued. Yeah. So there's a learning process to this as well because we've learned to reach out to our counterparts in all APEC economies uh, through written forms, more yeah. so in written forms than actual face-to-face uh, -face chats. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was Sarividya Rimutu, the Director of Substantive Matters at the National Secretariat of APEC 2020. That's it from me for this episode. Until we meet again. Bye-bye.